Good morning. Welcome to the first session of presentations for the day. I'm happy to welcome you. My name is Jean Ewart. I am the English and American literature, film and folklore librarian here at the University of Florida Libraries, which essentially means that I support the English department in any way that I possibly can, including ordering books for them and teaching library sessions to the English department classes, helping graduate students if they uh, need uh, expert advice on finding journals to place their work in, or if they're writing abstracts for conferences. Um, I'm very happy to introduce today's panel, all graduate students in the University of Florida English Departments. And uh, just a quick announcement for the people who are in the Zoom session. If you would like to pose questions to the panelists, we'll be taking all the questions at the end. Um, we ask that you put those questions not in the chat, which you're welcome to use, um, but if you would put them in the Q&A, question and answer category so that I can see those questions and pose them to the graduate students um, after all three papers. Okay, our first presentation today is by Maxine Donnelly. Maxine is a fifth year PhD student in English literature at the University of Florida. Her work focuses on late 19th and early 20th century children's and fantastic literature, particularly the role these genres play in British imperialism and nationalism. When not teaching or writing, Maxine cultivates her Victorian spinster image by embroidering and tinkering with pastry recipes. The title of Maxine's talk is Magic from the Margins, Lewis Carroll, George MacDonald, and Legacies of the Victorian Fantastic. Welcome, Maxine. Here we go. Can everyone hear me all right with the mask? I can talk a little louder. Excellent. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Let's see. Let's get situated here. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much for having me to speak with you all today. It's fantastic. Anyway, uh, I wanted to get started. So it might seem kind of odd to do so, but I'm going to be kicking off this session on Lewis Carroll by discussing a different writer. Uh, George MacDonald, a late Victorian Scottish fairy tale author, most famous for influencing fantasy giants J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. Uh, but far from crashing the Carroll party, I bring up MacDonald to illustrate Carroll's connection to other writers of his era and the influence these connections had on his work. Carol, oops, sorry, folks, I'm still figuring this out. There we go. There we go. Excellent. Uh, Carol and McDonald were contemporaries, but also friends, as some of you may know, with McDonald mentoring Carol before and during the Alice Books publication. And despite their stylistic and personal differences, both men were interested in the margins of both their fictional worlds and the real worlds that they lived in. They explored spaces and characters that were alienated from the centers or the so-called centers of things, underground worlds, underestimated children, and character or, and inhuman creatures, and redefined those margins as more complex than they might seem. This willingness to look to the margins isn't arbitrary, though. It comes from specific experiences, especially for McDonald of being marginalized in the Victorian United Kingdom that then made their way into fantasy literature as a larger genre through men like MacDonald and arguably I would say Carol. And that's what I'll be focusing on for this talk, my research into the colonial roots of British children's fantasy and how those colonial roots influenced even staunchly English or so-called English figures like Lewis Carroll through colonial figures like MacDonald. So I'll start here with a little bit of background on my larger project dissertation, nobody is surprised, um, but thinking a little bit more about my project central thesis. The so-called English high fantasy that so many of us, me included, grew up reading, texts written and influenced by C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, and their literary forebear George MacDonald, were not necessarily inherently English, whatever that means, at all. All three of these major fantasy authors came from the UK's colonial fringes, Lewis from Northern Ireland, Tolkien from South Africa, and MacDonald from Scotland. And all three, as well as many of the authors that they influenced, 
were interested in what fantasy scholar Maria, Cicic Maria Cicico Cicere calls magic in the minor. Bring up a brief quote for people to take a look at. So Maria Cicico, Oh, thank you very much. Maria Satike Cesare's Magic in the Minor is the unique power of small, the marginal, the childish, or the primitive past to bring, or the so-called primitive past rather, to bring magic back to the disenchanted contemporary world. I think these authors complicated personal relationships with Englishness. Their need to find a place in that identity drives this dynamic. So while British fantasy has sometimes been seen as this exclusive cloak for white men with no room for critique or change and an infatuation with the conservative past, which honestly, I don't agree with anyway, it isn't necessarily inherently so. It's got a certain fluidity to it, blurring boundaries sometimes despite the author's best efforts to stick to binary categories. And that fluidity, a fluidity that was a kind of post-colonial critique, I argue, bled through to more securely English authors, that we can debate that, like Lewis Carroll, and gives his writing the staying power that keeps it relevant today. This era of British fantasy is not just powerful to readers because it controls the marginal or the outside. It's powerful because it is of the outside at the same time and opens up nuances and possibilities that we can expand on in the present. So now that I've established a bigger picture of what I'm doing with all of this, let's get into the specifics of where this marginal magic comes from using George MacDonald as a test case. What was MacDonald's whole deal as a Scot in Victorian Britain? How did that influence his writing and his literary mentorship of Lewis Carroll? Does any of that matter almost two centuries later? To begin, Let's look at the McDonald Scotland, sorry, the Scotland McDonald was born into in 1824. This is not McDonald. It's just a random guy with a beard, but you get the picture. Um, he grew up in Aberdeenshire, Scotland, in an exiled Highlander family with ties to previous rebellions against English rule, right? He was inundated in a particularly Scottish culture and language from a young age. His uncle Mackintosh was a Gaelic scholar who traveled widely to preach in Scots Gaelic. Um, and preserved the language, while his grandfather supported the publication of the Ossian poems, which were a purported ancient Gaelic epic that later turned out to be presumably a hoax. However, this occurred in a context of what McDonald's biographer Jenny Neofaitu calls, quote, cultural nationalism rather than political independence. The new Scottish middle class, represented by folklorists and writers like Sir Walter Scott, romanticized this rugged, uh, manly, clan-based Scottish Celticism while incorporating it into the larger United Kingdom. It put, made the past this glamorous resource to mine while fitting into the inevitable future of a United Empire. Still, this incorporation brought things along that weren't expected, particularly a willingness to play at the boundaries of binaries and imagine what could be otherwise, often using the particular regional flavor we see in so-called Celtic literature and war. And to bring this all back around to George MacDonald, it offered the young man, and here the middle-aged man, uh, financial and social opportunities he couldn't find in Aberdeenshire. He moved south to England, became a minister, and then lost his position, thanks in part to his unconventional transcendentalist Christianity. Starting in the 1860s, he tried to make a living by writing both realist adult fiction and fairy tales targeted at children. Those fairy tales are what really bring him notoriety and why I'm bringing him up in the context of the Carroll Conference. Here we see MacDonald developing an understanding of storytelling as a way to connect across boundaries. As he later wrote in his 1867 manifesto, the imagination, its foundations and its culture, imaginative storytelling helps us, quote, be playfellows with God in this game, unquote, of creation and relationship to things outside ourselves. This might sound familiar to any of my Tolkien fans in the room. Uh, that Tolkien idea that writing is a sub-creation akin to God's creation comes directly from MacDonald. But what's relevant here and what I think we can see in Carol's work too is the interest in bridging gaps and prioritizing the lesser terms of binaries, which is kind of a Christian thing, but also is something that I argue comes from MacDonald's uh, sort of marginal location as a Scot in England. 
story is the means to do this binary bridging in McDonald's view, connecting us not only to people different from us, but to the larger forces that make us. And that requires taking stories seriously as a mode of critiquing and examining the world, seeing stories as theory, as true and useful, even or especially if they're imaginative. I don't think McDonald coming from one of Britain's internal colonies is the only reason we see this dynamic, but it is something that he shares with a number of others like C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, who had similar backgrounds as colonial figures. This kind of storytelling may have appealed to these men who saw themselves as culturally marginal. After all, you have an incentive to see difference with more nuance when you yourself come from outside. Even if, like McDonald, you may be trying to make this difference fit into a conservative understanding of the universal that's rooted in a specifically Christian morality. So let me give you a brief example of this dynamic before we move on to McDonald's connection with Carol. One of John McDonald's most famous children's texts is the 1871 novel, The Princess and the Goblin. A spunky but sweet little princess Irene leads a sheltered life until she encounters a mysterious fairy great-grandmother figure in the unused spaces of her home. She then learns of a race of goblins living in the nearby mountains who have a vendetta against humans and her particularly. With the help of a poor but courageous miner's son named Curdy and magical gifts from her great-grandmother, Irene manages to defeat the goblins and show the power of magic, which is a stand-in for Christian divinity, in the face of unbelieving adults. Sounds pretty conventional, and it certainly ends up that way. Evil portrayed as a lower class and un-English in this sort of swarm via the goblins is defeated by the angelic alliance of child and divine. But like Alice's adventures, it's the unruly middle that intrigues me here. The goblins are the big bad, but they aren't the amorphous mass of mindless evil you'd expect. We hear them talking to each other and see that they have a society that makes sense to them. They're people in ways the lot of fantasy baddies aren't. There's a resonance with colonial experience here. The goblins in the book apparently evolved from humans when they rebelled against what they perceived as injustice and moved underground to escape it. The goblin leaders plan a kind of reverse colonization invasion of the human world and are annihilated by the story's end. But the goblins as a whole persist and eventually improve relations with humans and incorporation into the so-called right order of human supremacy but an incorporation nonetheless, which is something you don't always see at this era. Much like McDonald's experience of blending Scottishness into a larger British identity, the margins are only powerful to the extent they support a conservative status quo. But despite clear boundaries of inside and outside, there's a play within boundaries where binaries are deconstructed and the seemingly minor, children, the lower class, even the non-human have agency and importance to help build that status quo from their own unique perspective. And that's where I bring us to McDonald's influence on Carol. Uh, as you can see, uh, they were actually quite close. This is part of the McDonald family with Carol in 1860. As you may have noticed, McDonald's major work appears after Alice's adventures were released in 1865. So I won't say there's a direct literary influence there. I actually think Irene with her spunkiness and zingers directed at adults might have a touch of Alice to her rather than vice versa. And the two men had very different social standings, although they had similar social circles. Carol had a position at Oxford and the ear of everyone from the conservative politician, the later prime minister, Ward Salisbury, to Tennyson, to the pre-Raphaelite circles of John Ruskin and Dante Gabriel Rossetti. McDonald, in contrast, was a professional writer, always scrambling to make ends meet, though he too had a number of influential friends and they intersected in other ways. But despite these differences, Carol was very close to McDonald and his family, as we can see here, before and during Alice's publication. McDonald received the story with interest and gave drafts of the story to his large brood of 11 children to read. His son Greville later remembered his quote, a vowel, I wish there were 60,000 volumes of it. Yeah, that's the kid who said that. The enthusiastic reaction helped drive the story's publication. It had appealed to to the little girls, but this proved it would appeal to more readers. McDonald also helped Carol with the ins and outs of publication, recommending illustrators and publishers to him as he developed drafts of Alice. All told, McDonald was probably Carol's model for being a working writer, as he's the author Carol worked most closely with during his early literary career. And they certainly fed each other's success. 
The Atlas books created a hunger for spunky children and fantastic worlds that McDonald was able to fill and profit from in his own work. But there's also a deep resonance between the way these two men use stories and why that still connects with us today. Both McDonald's fairy tales and Carol's Alice stories dig into the marginalized role children sometimes have in Western culture, alienated observers of a world they didn't create and often are reluctant to join. Alice and Irene are both underestimated and alienated by adults, by magical creatures, and perhaps even by readers until they prove their worth. By looking at the world from the marginalized position often assigned to children, Alice's adventures and the princess and the goblin point out and sometimes deconstruct these binary categories that seem self-evident from the so-called center that is often assigned to adults. And that perspective in turn leads Carol and McDonald away from the sometimes conservative religious and social boundaries they lived in their personal lives toward a greater fluidity in trying to forge relationships with child readers and the magic they represented. They also open the possibility of relating across and deconstructing other margin center binaries, racial, imperial, gendered, class, even human versus non-human. I'd argue we owe at least some of this dynamic, though not all, to the precarious status men like McDonald held in the larger British empire and that mode of storytelling appealing then to more established so-called English figures like Carol. Even so, the emphasis on the so-called minor or margin that these two help popularize in fantasy makes the genre particularly useful in deconstructing questionable elements of our own world, even if the worldviews of these two men wouldn't necessarily have encompassed some of these recuperations. It's why I think we keep being compelled by Victorian fantasy, even though the genre's prejudices against women, people of color, and other minorities can sometimes be evident, depending on the author. There's a fluidity within that structure that attracts us as it attracted men like Lewis Carroll. By making story itself a mode of theorizing the world, men like Carroll and MacDonald not only gave us compelling tales, but compelling tools. And while the adaptability of those tools means they can be used for many purposes, I'm particularly intrigued to see the legacy of deconstruction these two men established continue with playing out in fantastic genres today. So if anybody is interested in any of the things that I talked about today, um, these are some of the useful sources I used to assemble this talk. I particularly recommend um, Artful Dodgers by Mara Gubar, which many of you will probably know of, but also Reenchanted by Maria Sachiko Sassiri, who really helped shape a lot of the arguments in this talk. Thank you very much for your attention. We're doing Q and A right now. Are we? Are we doing Q and A now or later? Thank you, Maxine. Our next speaker is Felipe Gonzalez Silva. He's a fourth year PhD candidate, congratulations, um, just passed his exams in the English department at the University of Florida. He is working on his qualifying exam, oh, I'm sorry, he passed his qualifying exams um, for a dissertation on adaptation studies, fidelity and post-cinema. 
He's also a beginning filmmaker who experiments with found footage. The title of his paper is Haptic Engagements in Wonderland, Alice's Adaptations at the Baldwin Library. Where? Oh, okay. Thank you. Hello. Does this work? Well, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, are we screen sharing? Because I noticed there was the sign up there, but now it's gone. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so, as Dr. Eward said, my uh, presentation is titled Haptic Engagements in Wonderland Alice's Adaptations at the Baldwin Library. So to start, I would like to give some, I'll use this. Um, There you go. Thank you. Uh, so I would like to give some general information about a course I taught last semester. It was the course called ENC 1131, ENC 1131 Writing Through Media, which I subtitled Introduction to Film Adaptation. In that course, I focused on film history, adaptation studies, and I looked at a very varied range, I think, of movie adaptations. Um, so I, I, I look at adaptations from countries like China, the United Kingdom, Senegal, Iran, and the Czech Republic. Some of the source texts that I use from those countries were short stories, poems, plays, paintings, novellas, comics, and even a Twitter thread. Uh, so as you can see, uh, this is one of the connections I had between Jules Verne uh, facing the flag and Carol Simmons' Invention for Destruction. So I had a very heavy emphasis on the adaptation practice. I was very interested in students working through adaptations, in making adaptations themselves, which is, I think, a problem that the field of adaptation studies has right now, uh, because they think too much sometimes about theory as if it were separated from practice. And they don't think too much about audiences, too much about the adaptation practice itself. And so I had throughout the semester some assignments that I called mini adaptations. So in those mini adaptations, I asked students to use Canva or PictoChart, which are uh, resources that you can use online for free. Of course, you can pay for them to uh, get better access. And I asked them to create mini adaptations in the form of Instagram posts, menus, infographics, pamphlets, and just anything they could think of uh, to create a mini adaptations, uh, a mini adaptation of the source text that we uh, study throughout the semester. Uh, so the first project could, for example, choose uh, Jean Renoir's uh, A Day in the Country to create an Instagram post to readapt the film. Uh, so I wanted them to consider the Instagram, just one moment. Okay, sorry. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, so I was very interested, or at least initially, in thinking about those intermedial differences, which connected to a reading that is key to adaptation studies, which is uh, Seymour Chapman's What Novels Can Do That Films Can't, and vice versa. Uh, even though we later problematized that idea about medium specificity, it was something that I wanted students to think about, because after all, there are some differences between media. So I told them, let's say that you are going to create an Instagram post to adapt 
uh, Renoir's A Day in the Country or Maupassant's story, which is uh, what Renoir used to base his uh, film from. Uh, so I asked them, think about the features, possibilities, limitations to select the elements from the film that you could magnify, develop, or even ignore. So I asked them, what is essential about a day in the country, if anything? So invoking Chapman, what can an Instagram post do that films can't? Can and should this new adaptation echo Maupassant's short story? How? Uh, so throughout the semester, as I said, I asked them to uh, create three of these adaptations. So I got, for example, menus, abstract reimaginings with different figures, job postings, board games, pamphlets of class texts like Fantastic Mr. Fox, Alien, Hemingway's short story, The Cat in the Rain, uh, and Carol Semen's Invention for Destruction, which I have pictured here, uh, and also Persepolis uh, inspired students. Uh, during week 13, I had a, uh, a unit on engravings, illustrations, pop-ups, and adaptations. So this is where I'm, I'm starting to move into uh, Lewis Carroll, which I know it's our focus here. Uh, so for the week readings and viewings, I had them read Kate Newell's pop-up books, Spectacle and Story. Uh, it's from a book on adaptation theory, and she focuses on pop-up books as adaptations. Uh, so it's sort of an introduction to pop-up books. I also asked them to read, this one was optional, but A.B. Evans, the illustrators of Jules Verne's Voyage Extraordinaires, because uh, I was very interested in the uh, illustrations, particularly of Leon Bennett, which of course uh, I'm sure you know. And I also have, had a short video from YouTube titled From Paper to Copper, The Engraver's Process. Um, so that video was, um, it was an engraving demonstration by Andrew Stein from the Rhode Island School of Design. So I was very interested in those haptic encounters with these materials. So that's why that word uh, is of course in my, the title of my presentation. I wanted them to think about how um, those uh, sources, whatever they were, ask them to engage with, with, um, with films or with short stories and so on uh, in a bodily manner. Uh, of course, I'm also thinking here about Laura Marx's uh, optic, uh, haptic visuality to think about that. Um, and of course, at the end of the week, we had a Baldwin visit. Uh, and so that was uh, organized by uh, Dr. Caponegro, who was very, very helpful. We actually met in this room so my students were able to see many uh, different versions, iterations, adaptations uh, of the Alice's in Wonderland books. Uh, but of course we needed to be prepared for that visit uh, because the network of adaptations, if I may call it like that, of Alice in Wonderland is quite vast, of course. So they had to read the novel first. They, we also watch uh, a very short adaptation of Alice in Wonderland, which is the first film adaptation from 1903. Uh, we also watch Alice by Spank Meyer. Uh, it's a stop motion uh, animation adaptation. Very interesting, very different. Um, also, it's a very, I would say, bodily experience, how you connect to those images that sometimes are uh, disconnected or maybe not so focused on narrative development, but more so about a feeling ex an experience. Uh, so that's Alice. And we also watch clips from Alice in Wonderland from 1933. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. It's very interesting, I would say. And also, of course, the Disney adaptation, uh, because all of these are part of uh, that network that I'm talking about. Oh, sorry. And we also read another um, book chapter, uh, another chapter from Kate Newell's book, which was Introduction, Not in Kansas Anymore, Adaptation Network. So think about um, connections between adaptations and how uh, the way that we engage with Alice in Wonderland is mediated by the adaptations that we later read, even though the source text in itself continues to exist and it doesn't change in its form, we could say at least the written text, but 
uh, by engaging with other texts, our experience, our understanding of, of that text changes. So at the Baldwin, we had some prompts uh, by the curator. I only want to highlight some because I don't have enough time, but these were some of the most important questions that I thought, or at least the ones that ended up being the most productive for my students in their adaptation practice. Uh, so one of them said, if you were going to turn Alice's Adventures in Wonderland into a movable book, which we had, uh, the Baldwin has a few of them, which scene or moment would you most want to adapt into this format and why? So I was very interested in questions of choice, of prominence. And of course, it's also a question about legacy, about the impacts of adaptations, as I was saying, in our understanding of texts. So again, to reiterate, Carol's Alice exists in the novel in its quote unquote original form, but it's also inevitably and productively mediated by innumerable versions, translations, adaptations, and so on. So it was also an opportunity for students to place themselves in that uneven and multi-network tradition of the text. Where do we go next? What do we repeat? What do we ignore? How do we respond to it? What can I perhaps contribute to that network? Um, another question from the prompts was, how do you envision your movable book looking or working? Use words and or images. So that's more of a practical question that they also had to think about because as I said, during the entire semester, they were working on creating their own adaptations. Um, so talking about more of those haptic encounters, I was very interested in the materiality of the text of the Baldwin and their role in the adaptation process. And that reminded me of an adaptation scholar, Amanda Rod, who, understands adaptations as experience expressing experience. And so she says uh, that they accomplish two things, and I quote, sensory events that reflect on the experience of the adapted thing, novel, film, et cetera, filtered through the memory and subjectivity of the adapter, while offering that experience to an other audience. And then the other thing they accomplish is that they reflexively comment on the means by which that experience can be conveyed, which is the medium. So again, thinking about medium specificity, even though that's of course a difficult uh, matter to look into, uh, it's, I, I never wanted my students to think about medium media as completely separate entities. But of course we were looking for bridges, we were looking for blurred boundaries. Uh, but we had to think about if I'm making an Instagram post, there are some things that I can do and cannot do uh, different from a short story or any other media. Uh, so the final assignment was an adaptation screenplay. And for that one, I proposed to them a series of texts that I wanted them to adapt. Uh, so the first thing they had to do was to annotate the text. Then they had to write a rationale to explain to me why are you interested in this text? Why do you feel motivated to adapt it? Then they have to write a concept and a method. So they had to tell me how they wanted to adapt it in terms of filmmaking. So it's not only about screenwriting, but also filmmaking. Um, then we had a peer review so that they could share their thoughts and see what others were working on. And finally, the adaptation uh, screenplay. So the first one that I proposed them to use was I haven't been to a Taco Bell since, which is a video on TikTok that went viral. I don't know if you have seen it. It's very, very funny. And it's something that I think we need to engage with that media of, uh, I mean, social media. There was also a short story by Carmen Naranjo, Simbiosis del Encuentro or Symbiotic Encounter. Very difficult text in a way, so I was, interested in maybe a more abstract approach to an adaptation. Also the poem When Roots Are Exposed by Esther Berlin. Uh, Trailer Park Garden uh, by Steve Dohanos, uh, which is a painting. Uh, it's exhibited at the uh, Harn Museum, which is on campus. So I asked the students who chose that one, it was only one, but I asked them to go see that painting uh, in person because that materiality, that physical encounter with the painting was very important to me. And finally, some selection from Calvin and Hobbes stories uh, by Bill Watterson, of course. Um, what I did was 
I selected a few of them that uh, picture Calvin in one of his, um, in some of his space adventures. So I wanted them to have kind of a coherent uh, narrative there to work with. Um, and of course, when they worked on these adaptations, I realized how much they learned from the experience of the Baldwin, uh, all those different, uh, different approaches to texts uh, and how sometimes even though we're thinking too much about hierarchies, too much about what's the original text and so on, there is something to be said about these texts. They are of course not um, ossified. There's something uh, again to change about their networks. Uh, so that was very, very productive. Uh, and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just gonna scroll. Oh, you're scrolling through. Okay. Okay, thank you, Felipe. Okay, hold one minute. Okay, our third and final speaker on this panel is Catherine Hampshire. She's a fourth year PhD candidate in English at the University of Florida. She focuses on researching and teaching children's and young adult literature, critical disability studies, and monster theory, although she also enjoys teaching medieval and Renaissance British literature. She earned her BA and MA from the universities in Indiana and moved here to Gainesville specifically to pursue her PhD at UF because of faculty expertise in children's literature and the resources available through the Baldwin. She enjoys cross-stitching, baking, listening to podcasts, and spending time with her three cats. The title of the paper is Documentary as Rabbit Hole, Archive as Wonderland. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, awesome. All right, I'm gonna start my timer. Thank you all so much. Uh, so um, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna get right along started. Uh, so I am gonna be talking about um, a course that I taught last semester, and I'm gonna go through some information about the course, um, my rationale for including a lot of literary theory, arguably uh, for an undergraduate course, and then talk about those two elements um, that my title refers to, the documentary and the archive elements that I included. So um, the course that I taught was Literature 4332, um, and my title for it was Questions of Representation in Literature for the Young Child. And I'll get into that, um, that word representation and the triple meaning that I gave to it in my course on the next slide. But it was an upper div English course for majors and minors um, students. I mostly had uh, juniors and seniors, but I had a couple sophomores, and I think I had one first year. Um, so I incorporated elements of theory, literary criticism, and uh, archival experience into this course. And it was uh, this past spring semester, and I had 35 students, which is the most I have ever had. So that was a fun experience um, too, to get to know that many students. So 
Um, here's some information about the course um, and everything that I have on the slides I'm saying out loud. So if text is visually overwhelming for you, I mostly have it there for accessibility purposes. Um, so I had obviously an introduction unit and a conclusion unit, but my three uh, in between units are the ones that I'm going to talk about briefly here. So, um, and this is also where we get those three meanings of representation that I referenced. So my first unit was about representing diversity. So representation in the way that we normally think about it um, in terms of um, intersectionality. And the theories that I included in that section were introductions to critical disability studies, uh, queer theory, critical race theory, post-colonialism, and eco-criticism. So each week I had uh, on the Monday of that week, I would have an introduction set of readings, very short, very accessible, some of them from the Purdue OWL set of readings um, on theory. And then I would have picture books that related to or allowed us to practice with that theory and some, have some fun with uh, the opportunities that it presents. And then the second um, of my three main units was about representing narratives through nonfiction, adaptation, and flipped scripts. And here we had introductions to reader response theory, feminist theory, and Marxist theory. And then my final main unit for the semester was representational beings, so things that represent other things. Um, and that's where I got into monster theory, cultural studies, psychological theories on literature, and finally formalism, which is where most people would start, but that's where I ended. Uh, so that was uh, the basic setup of my class. And I included two different archive visits uh, in this semester. One was during week four, which was on race and ethnicity. Um, and I included critical race theory in that week. And the texts that I had them read were The Snowy Day and The Proudest Blue. Um, and for both of my archive visits, I kind of uh, dovetailed it with um, like a documentary that they had to watch on their own time as an assignment and the archive visit itself. So for the uh, week on race, they watched uh, Tell Me Another Story, a really excellent um, documentary from the Ezra Jack Keats Foundation that Ramona um, had a part in creating. And uh, that archive visit was focused on giving them an opportunity to engage at their comfort level with various banned, racist, problematic, and some progressive for their time uh, texts in relation to representations of race. So a lot of editions of Little Black Sambo, if you're familiar with that. Uh, and now to, uh, to the main part uh, that we wanna talk about today, the Alice week. Uh, so on week 11, so this is a pretty decent jump ahead in the semester, they read the entirety of Alice. Um, so that was most of their first time actually reading the, the text itself. And I gave a little bit of attention to Marxist theory in that week as well. So the documentary that they watched was Who Wrote Alice in Wonderland? The Secret World of Lewis Carroll. And uh, that's from Timeline. And the archive uh, visit was focused on a collection of Alice inspired materials at the Baldwin, uh, which many of you are most likely already familiar with. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the way that I structured the uh, documentary as a rabbit hole, essentially. Um, so I assigned it for them to view prior to the visit, and they had a, a response paper to write that um, they submitted prior to the day when we would have the archive visit. And the documentaries were both addressing some more difficult concepts. Um, so the Tell Me Another Story one, talked a lot about race and racism, issues of representation, erasure, privilege. It was um, something that was a lot of heavy concepts, but with some hope in there as well. Um, and so they would watch the documentary and then reflect on it and submit that reflection. And then uh, on the archive visit day, we would be able to engage with the materials themselves and um, ex explore its, potential as a wonderland. Sorry, forgot to grab my water, so I'm a little um, parched. So uh, the, arc, the one that I had them write or, or watch for the Alice week was uh, this one from Timeline. And it talked about the text creation, um, the ways that it has lasted uh, from the time it's creation to today, which Maxine did a great job of uh, talking about in her talk. Um, it talked about the real Alice that the text was inspired by, and it included um, information about uh, Dodson himself and the controversies that many of you are familiar with. Um, and this was what made it a rabbit hole. 
Um, I'm, I'm not going to get into the arguments uh, about that controversy, but the documentary does present both sides of that argument. And um, a lot of my students uh, responded to that in their, uh, their reflection papers with a lot of, um, a lot of emotional um, reactions that they, uh, they were able to express in, in that space. Uh, this is one where uh, one of my students talked about how the documentary reminded her a lot of J.M. Barry and his relationship with the Davies boys. Regardless of how much evidence we have now pointing toward one way or another, we will never know the truth about these relationships. And that kind of sums up what a lot of students responded uh, to the documentary like. But they also were looking at how the documentary um, gave them an insight into the making of the book. Um, and it, this uh, student was reflecting on how the page where the mouse's words are shaped to look like his tail um, is super cool because it had to have its own special copper plate for printing. And uh, she really appreciated how the documentary gave her a little more information about bookbinding um, that we followed up with in the uh, archive visit. I have a couple more quotes from my students. Um, so uh, in addition to those first two, uh, a few others said, uh, the wonders and oddities of childhood can quickly be forgotten when we become adults. The book's continued popularity among children speak to how successfully Carol managed to remember. And then another student said, Carol seemed to perfectly capture the narrative of childhood and growing up his childlike imagination and whimsy evident in his stories could signify that he is enamored with childhood and not necessarily the children themselves. And then finally, Alice and her sisters, thank you so much. <laughs> Alice and her sisters were intriguing forces in Carol's life. And it was fascinating to see the way they lived and how they acted at Oxford and from the familial accounts included. So the documentary responses showed the ways that um, the documentary in all of its different sections was pulling them down different rabbit holes. And um, then when we had the archive experience, this gave them a tangible wonderland to explore. This actual space that we're in right now is where we had that. So we would have um, some introductory discussion over here. And then over on this side of the room, there were tons of different texts that they could explore. We spent maybe the first 10 minutes on some brief lecture, some Q&A um, with Ramona and Neil. I don't know if they've had the opportunity to meet uh, Neil, but he's the, um, he, he helps out with the special collections here. So uh, then the rest of the time was for them to just look at the materials and explore them. They were able to choose which text they wanted to look at. They could take them over here and look at them more closely. They could take pictures. I gave them a few prompts to give them uh, guidance on where to uh, kind of direct their attention because it can be a little overwhelming. And some of these uh, are quotes from student responses um, in their reflection that they would submit after the archive visit. So they had a reflection on the documentary um, and then they also had a reflection on the visit itself. So uh, a lot of these students um, were taking on the prompt that I gave them of looking at specific characters and how they're represented in two to three different texts. So um, this first quote, in Tenniel's illustration, Alice and the mouse are roughly the same size, which makes them equals to the viewer. Other illustrations depict the mouse as larger than Alice, which makes him more intimidating and more of a visual threat. And here you can see one of my students really using um, the theory that they got from reading Molly Bang's Picture This as a uh, structural um, formative text at the very beginning of the semester for analyzing visual images. Um, and then here we have a student talking about uh, the Moser uh, illustrations of the Mad Hatter um, as being a realistic depiction of a man, a gothic dark version at odds with the buffoonery laced into his character in the text. So this student is uh, looking at the ways that the illustration complicates the text itself and how they perhaps create a tension that enhances the whimsy of um, the original source text. And then finally, I have a student um, who had a, a quote about one of the pop-up books, um, which 
connects back to what Felipe was talking about with some of those wonderful uh, pop-up book adaptations that the Baldwin has available. And uh, this student said, the pop-up books perfectly capture the book's silliness and whimsy. The different perspectives point to how Tenniel focuses on Alice's experience and how she sees the world, whereas the pop-up book looks at how the world sees Alice. So I have a few pictures that students took of some of their favorite uh, images from the pictures in the Baldwin. And this is one of the pop-up books that my students really appreciated. So this green part, if um, you can imagine, it's something that you pull up from the page. And then if you put your eye against this little hole here, this is what you see um, inside. So this is her falling down the rabbit hole. Um, but we also have some other illustrations here like the Salvador Dali um, illustrations of the caterpillar, which they found really fascinating. So um, I just wanted to, to put some of their favorite images up for you to see. Um, and I know that uh, this is technically supposed to end at 1045 and I wanna make sure that there's time for Q&A. So I'll just um, you know, end with my little thank you slide and also let you know that um, all of the little images that I had throughout my slideshow are from a Lewis Carroll Dings font. Um, it's a Wingdings font that is entirely made up of his doodles. So um, you can just look that up and download it for your own um, fun. And um, you know, if you want to make a weird PowerPoint like me, there you go. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, thank you all so much. That was were wonderful. And now if we could have all three speakers come to the front for a little Q&A. If you are in the room, just raise your hand and I will bring you the mic and you can ask the question. And if you are in Zoom, just put it in Q&A and Jean will let me know when the questions are there to be shared with the room as well as Zoom. Yeah, yeah. We stand right behind here, from here to here. Anyone have a first question? Uh, the question, my question is for uh, Felipe. Um, what were some of the most interesting insights or projects that resulted from your students' interactions with, with the text? What, what did you find most fun? Uh, so regarding the Alice text or any text? Yeah. That's a very hard question. Um, so they never adapted Alice. So there wasn't a specific uh, adaptation that they created from Alice, but I saw some of those, I don't know, like affects that they found when they were uh, working on Alice. Um, no, that's a hard question. Let me think about it more. Um, I wish I, I, I would have asked uh, my students with more time so I could share some of their adaptations. Um, no, let, let me get you back, get, get back to you. I'll think more about it, sorry. Hi, I'm sorry, I forgot everyone's name. The, um, you, yes, <laughs> hello, sorry. Um, so you talked about critical disability theory, uh, which I work with and I teach about. And um, I was wondering if you, and I also am an Alice collector, so I was wondering mm -hmm. how you, if you found a way to meld the two of those. Yeah, um, I found that as the semester progressed, every additional theory that I, uh, introduced them to became part of a toolbox that they would bring with them to each additional uh, text. So even though critical disability studies was at the very beginning of the semester, it did come up in conversation throughout the entire semester, which was kind of on purpose because that's my main thing too. So I wanted it to be present uh, the whole semester. But I think uh, with Alice, um, I'm pretty sure the, the, mo the main ways that it came up were in uh, thinking about how uh, it speaks in a, a type of voice that um, perhaps more, um, it, it, it sounds almost like a neurodivergent voice. Mm. Um, and so there was like some discussion of how 
the way that it's written can engage different, um, different kinds of children who think different ways. I think that was the main way that it came up, but um, I mean, that was critical disability studies was in week three and Alice was in week 11. So they had slept since then. <laughs> okay, and you know that Carol himself had a stutter. And yeah. so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we did. I, I think that came up in the documentary um, and they like, we did discuss that a little bit. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. Uh -huh. Catherine, um, it was just amusing that you put Marxism criticism in the same week you introduced Alice, and I was wondering if there was any conscious thought for doing that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was on purpose. <laughs> um, so we were talking about issues of class um, and the ways that um, like the, the power dynamics at work and uh, the, the people who have positional uh, power within Wonderland, like the Queen um, and the Duchess. Um, we, we were talking about those kinds of positions and the material resources that different individuals had access to, um, as well as the role of education in the time period, like the Victorian era, and how uh, those kinds of aspects of um, economic structure would inform the text. Uh, so that's kind of the main ways that it, it came up. Um, but I also had a, um, a very short essay that I had found on Marxism and Alice in Wonderland that I had them read. So that was part of why I paired it was because I found this really short, really um, easy to read essay about it. Maxine, oh. I really appreciated the comment that you made about how when you find something in yourself that feels marginalized, it opens you up to uh, thinking of other people mm. and their marginalization. Um, and I was wondering if you had any other thoughts that you'd like to share on that topic or the use of fiction as a way to open us up to real life um, compassion. Yeah. Um, this is something that I find uh, very important in a lot of my research, um, uh, especially as a young white woman growing up in the South, there is a, a lot going on there. Um, however, I think at least in the context of the kinds of literature that a fair number of us study in this room, children's literature, fantasy, children's fantasy, um, I think that Oftentimes, the fantastic gives us a way to both distance the difficulties of the things that we are dealing with in such a way that we can encounter them more, uh, more critically, and also offers um, and also offers some models of like how to deal with that. Um, like, do we rebel against the evil queen? Uh, do we do we attempt to behead the red queen, or do we do we let her behead us? that kind of thing. Um, in terms of, I just wanted to clarify if, you th if this is a thing in terms of research, in terms of teaching, in terms of the kinds of research that we do, um, what specifically might you be interested in? Because I could talk forever about this. <laughs> it's, it's your, it's your, your thoughts. All right, all right. So I'll just tape it very quick. I think for me, it is interesting in the sense of you have to, you have to realize again that these are not just tales, as I said, but tools um, and tools that can be used in many different ways. Um, we have a number of fantasies in our own society that are about as unbased as going down the rabbit hole. Um, uh, I know that I grew up with the idea of the sort of bootstraps myth of American uh, success, that, that that's a significantly more fantastical than a, than a talking rabbit in my experience. However, um, I think that when I think that when we try to get into the mindset of someone who is marginalized in uh, the society that we know, I think that that gives us a perspective that is in many ways seems fantastical, but is perhaps more realistic in some ways than others. And I think that that sort of flips around as well too, when we think about someone like Carol, who, as your students said, seems to understand an, an experience of childhood that is very both alienating and also really productive. 
And I think trying to get into that alienating slash productive mindset is the thing that has been the most important for me in my research and in reading someone like Carol, who gives us the tool to think of what would it be like if I was not the person that I am? What would it be like if I changed, if I grew, if I shrank, if I was given more respect or less respect? What would happen? And the, th the thinking of what if, again, I think is something that people on the margins have to think about a lot more. And also I think is something that everybody can get something very interesting and important out of. So I have a question for all three of you. So for Catherine, um, one of your students had mentioned that Lewis Carroll was more obsessed with childhood instead of children. For Felipe, um, I noticed you had shown them the Swinkmeyer version of Alice, which is maybe appropriate for children. I don't think so. Very creepy. I mean, I watched it as a kid on accident. Um, we got a VHS from Goodwill. We thought it was Alice. It wasn't what we thought it would be. So this very <laughs> creepy version. And then uh, for Maxine, even in your research, you were just talking about the alienation mm. of children and how the Victorian child, I don't know, representations, but also how we conceptualize the Victorian child or how authors did it. So I guess I wanted to just ask um, all three how maybe in your class or just in general, if there was a distinction between children and childhood or how your students or how your research, how you deal with it in your research, how do you distinguish those two things? Yeah. Oh gosh, okay, I guess I'll go first. Um, I mean, we, we talked in my, um, in my class about the distinction um, and the ways that society tends to, um, in general view children um, through a lens of like like lacking agency and uh, lacking um, like the intellect to make their own decisions and not being able to have anything like productive to add to society like you know that they are in a, a class of um, people that has uh, relatively like less rights and um, so we talked about how those ideas of childhood affect material children, mm. um, people like in, in the meat space. And um, so I guess we, we talked a lot about how ideas of childhood and like um, childhood innocence, for example, with um, when we talked about where the wild things are, we talked mm. about how it was uh, going kind of against how a lot of the picture books of the time were representing childhood um, in a glass case of innocence and um, that the, uh, the text where the wild things are is um, kind of allowing space for children to have difficult emotions and process them. So we, we did talk about how the ideas of childhood um, can be in conflict with actual children and what they need and desire. Okay, uh, you can go ahead by all means. Uh, so, yeah, the Frank Meyer's Alice is quite shocking. I don't know if you have seen it. Um, I don't know if I want to say if, whether it's appropriate for children or not, but uh, now that Catherine was speaking uh, about it, I do think that there's a very interesting tension going on in the film because on the one hand, it's a text that seems to be pushing you away, trying to scare you, maybe bring something very uh, primal for you even. Uh, but then at the same time, we have Alice, who is a very, she's not that child uh, inside a glass case that Catherine was talking yeah, about, as yeah. we sometimes see childhood and then put children in, in there. Um, because at the end of the day, she's the one who creates that illusion. And that's very clear in Sphinx Meyer's uh, Alice. Uh, it's a very material Alice. So everything that she experiences, everything that she sees in that film is made out of household items. Oh. Um, so there are some very, I wouldn't say gory scenes to it. Uh, but you see some sawdust uh, coming out of some of those puppets. Um, so it does have that very violent effect to it, uh, which comes from a child. So I think, again, there's a, an interesting tension to, to think about there. Uh, 
And also, sorry about the other question. I blanked completely. I was looking at all of my students' submissions yesterday and today, and I forgot. But I was thinking more. And so actually, there was one student who created a board game of Alice. It was only one page. It was kind of fashioned after the staircase, so very iconic. But at the same time, she put her own spin to it. And of course, like go back to and, and um, with the bottles and uh, the biscuits and so on. And there was another one, another student who adapted Invention for Destruction, which is, of course, not Alice. Uh, but it also had that uh, very clear um, impulse for imagination there because he broke down several um, creations that we see in the film. They are uh, modes of transportation that are not really uh, realistic, but in that world, they do exist. Uh, and so there was, um, yeah, that, that uh, element of imagination that I think he was bringing uh, from there. And also, of course, I mentioned The Cat in the Rain, Hemingway's short story. Uh, so it has a cat. So we have a cat in Alice, of course. And so one of those students was playing with that presence and absence of the cat, which is also, mm. in a way, key to Hemingway's story. Uh, and what he did was he visually presented that story. So that cat kept, it was never certain whether the cat was there or not. Uh, and now I know that I'm going in a different direction, perhaps, but um, I think there was also a connection there. Mm. Um, okay. Oh, yes, good. Um, so when it comes to like the division between children and childhood, that's something that I try to keep in perspective whenever I'm writing about children's literature um, and often when I'm teaching children's literature. And sometimes I get these delightful conversations with students about the division between um, say children's literature and literature that is written for children versus literature that is written by children. I had one student whose name I'm blanking on, but I will look her up, um, who once told me, I think that fanfic might be children's literature, fan fiction specifically. So things that are written about existing media properties because of the majority of people who write them are minors. <laughs> not, not all, there are a number of old, old guard fanfic writers. Um, I am not one of them, I am not brave enough. However, that kind of insight of the idea that things that are quote unquote appropriate for children versus the smut that is online that is written by minors, there's some interesting tension there. But one other thing that I want to pay attention to in my research is that oftentimes what you have is this sort of use of children as a metaphor for something else or use of other things as a metaphor for children. So specifically what I'm thinking about in the Victorian context is the idea of women, people of color, and to the extent that people had labels for them, queer people, as childlike in a negative sense. The idea that, oh, once these people grow to full maturity, then we can give them political rights, but they probably won't. So, you know, let's just, let's just let this happen. Um, those are two things that I really want to pay a huge amount of attention to. Specifically, number one, that sometimes children slash minors are communicating with and or writing their own stuff that is interesting and that I wish I had more access to, but alas, I am one of the olds now. <laughs> um, but also that the idea of something as being a child is, as you said, Catherine, often a way of condemning that thing to a life of no agency. Okay, I think we've got one question in the room and one in Zoom, and then we'll wrap it up after those two. Mm -hmm. First of all, I want to take your classes um, that I, you know, when I was in most of us, when we were in college, children's literature wasn't something you could study in college. And we're really happy that that's changed um, on the subject of adaptation. I, I've just I've spent the last year working on adapting one of my novels for the stage. And it occurs to me that Lewis Carroll was really the first print adapter of Alice in creating the nursery Alice. And I wondered if you made a distinction or if you talked about the difference between an author adapting their own work versus someone who is not the author adapting the work. Uh, so at some point when we talked about Usman Semben, he wrote a, a short story. Don't remember the name right now, The Promised Land. And then he adapted it to uh, the film La Noire, Black Girl. So we did talk about that then. 
Um, but maybe it was too specific to that context because in his case, he was, so he wrote his story in French. Uh, he's from Senegal. And at that time, most people in Senegal uh, could not read. So um, one of the reasons why he made the film was to make it more widely available for that audience, even though the film was in French because uh, he got financing from uh, the French uh, government. Uh, so that's the moment when we did talk about that a little bit, um, but more so in a practical way, perhaps. Um, that was the only example that that we have what, that we had about about it. Uh, there were so many things that I wanted to discuss in the class, uh, and of course there wasn't time. But I think that's a great thing to to also consider if it's your own work. Uh, what does that mean? which also connects to filmmaking itself, because let's say we have a screenwriter, director, they write the screenplay. And some people argue that directing a screenplay is adapting. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's some connections there too. And film is my main area. Uh, so I hopefully I get to teach this class again or a similar one where I can explore that further. Thank you. Uh, the final question is for Maxine. This is from Dieter DeLanga in the chat. Out of curiosity, in your study of Victorian fantasy, did you also take a look at Christina Rossetti's fantasy poem, Goblin Market, and her Alice-inspired fairy stories, Speaking Likenesses? Ooh. Carol knew the Rossettis and admired their poetry and painting, and since Christina's Goblin Market was published in 1862, when Alice was first told, he might have been influenced by it as Christina was influenced by him for speaking likenesses. Oh my goodness. Yes, thank you so much for that question. That's fantastic. First of all, I haven't gotten a hold of speaking likenesses because I literally just learned about it when I just taught Goblin Market in another course. And now I'm just like, ah, I have to rewrite the disc again. Anyway, um, all that said is I am endlessly fascinated by Goblin Market. I probably, I honestly think I read it while I was completely ignoring my AP English teacher and reading ahead in the uh, in the anthology in high school, um, and have taught it not uh, I think twice now um, in my survey of uh, British literature, and I get so many interesting and visceral reactions from it from both my students and myself. Um, in terms of how to read the goblins as symbolism, and I think again this kind of connects somewhat interesting with my research with the Rossettis being of Italian, Italian emigres uh, and having these really interesting um, sort of outsider with a chip on their shoulder kind of energy, especially Dante Gabriel Rossetti and the uh, Pre-Raphaelites, but I really want to get more into Rossetti. Um, so thank you so much for pointing that out because I really, I, hmm, there are many connections, thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you all so much for this panel. It was a wonderful start. Thank you.